Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Strake, former Secretary of State and former Chairman of the Republican Party. It's an honor for me to be here today to be associated with President, I mean, Senator Ted Cruz. Man, I apologize. It just came out. <laughs> <laughs> this is where the oil business started, right here on these hollow grounds. This is where jobs were created. This is where entrepreneurs were given a chance to improve themselves and their friends and their neighbors. I know. I was born to a father born in St. Louis whose first job after his parents died when he was one year old was a Western Union runner. He made $10 a week, and by the way, put in $2 a week in the collection basket. He was a man who went and followed his dream, went to Mexico, Cuba, returned to Texas, and thank God for myself and my six kids and 17 grandchildren found the Conroe oil field. So we know what it is like since his first job was a $10 job, we know what it was like for him to be successful. That is what Ted Cruz stands for. The opportunity for everybody, regardless of your background, or your ethnicity, or your religion, to succeed in this country. Ted Cruz, as you know, had a similar background in that his father, who sought freedom from the tyranny of Cuba, came to this country with hardly the shirt on his back. He took the freedom, he, he took the risk it takes to be free and to be rewarded and not be pitied if he failed. We are here today in the birthplace of the Texas oil industry to share with you his plans for Texas and the nation. May this entire country realize that they need to listen to this logic of this man and do what we ha we need to do what we can to support him in his endeavor. I give you my dear friend and a great American and a great Texan, Senator Ted Cruz. Well, thank you very, very much. It is great to be with you. Thank you for coming out and joining us. I want to thank David Porter for coming and being with us and for his leadership on the Railroad Commission. And I want to thank my dear friend, George Strake. He's a legendary oil man, an incredibly generous philanthropist who has given so much back to the community, has been a close friend and mentor of mine for many years. And George and I actually share something in common. More than once, George Strake has been confused with George Strait. <laughs> and with a name like Ted Cruz, <laughs> I can tell you I once was on an airplane and over the loudspeaker came a page asking if Tom Cruise was on the plane. <laughs> and somewhat sheepishly I came to the front of the plane and I said, I, I think maybe just possibly you might be looking for me. You have never seen so many disappointed flight attendants. <laughs> so George, I, I, I feel your pain and, and, and we, we won't ask necessarily for, uh, for a musical rendition at the end, end of the gathering. <laughs> well, let me say to everyone, welcome to Boomtown. This place reminds us of how American entrepreneurs ushered in a new era for America and for the world. Here at Spindletop, there is a 58 foot tall granite monument that reads on this spot, on the 10th day of the 20th century, a new era of civilization began. This discovery was made at a time when America needed energy, needed energy to glow, grow and expand to the Pacific. We were developing new tools, new transportation, and the energy that began here helped usher in a new era in the world. 
Today, as I travel the state of Texas, as I travel the country, the number one concern of Americans all over this nation is we want jobs and economic growth back. Under President Obama, the country has been mired in stagnation, what I call the Great Stagnation. From 2008 to 2012, our economy grew on average 0.9% a year. We're facing today the lowest labor force participation this country has seen since 1978. And the people who are hurting the most under the Obama economy are the most vulnerable among us. They're young people, they're Hispanics, they're African Americans, they're single moms. Those are the people who have lost their jobs, who have been forced into part-time work, who have lost their health insurance. And I have to tell you, it is truly a providential blessing that at a time when there is such a desperate need for new jobs, new high-paying jobs throughout the country, that we are simultaneously witnessing the beginning of an American energy renaissance. The American energy renaissance that is beginning before our eyes can help save us from the Obama economy. Right now, we're seeing energy production on private lands skyrocketing. Texas oil production has more than doubled in only 27 months. If Texas were considered a separate oil producing nation, Texas would be the ninth largest oil producing nation in the world. Now what does that mean? Over the last 12 months through June of 2013, payrolls in the state of Texas increased by 303,000 jobs. That was a 2.8% increase, roughly double the national level. Every business day over the last year, almost 1,300 new jobs were created in the Lone Star State. And many of those jobs were directly or indirectly related to the booming energy industry. The Texas unemployment rate has been at, has been below or at the national rate for 84 consecutive months. And what does that energy renaissance mean? What does it mean in terms of people's practical jobs? You know, the Dallas Morning News has observed in West Texas, a flood of money and workers into the region is impossible to miss. Anyone who's ever tried to go to Midland or Odessa and get a hotel room knows exactly what I mean. Down in South Texas with the Eagleford, kids with high school degrees are getting paid $80,000 a year to drive trucks. From 2001, to 2012, the number of Texas upper middle income jobs grew over 24%. You look at another state that's enjoying the energy boom, you look at North Dakota. North Dakota, the unemployment is 2.6%. In North Dakota, because of the energy production, a cashier at Walmart makes $17.50 an hour. A kid flipping burgers at McDonald's gets a $300 signing bonus. Now why is that? Because every one of them can go and get a job in the oil fields that pays so much more and that lifts the condition for everyone, makes it possible for everyone to achieve the American dream. You know, the president is pressing right now, raising the minimum wage to $10.10 an hour. And yet the truth is, the real Obama minimum wage is zero dollars because of the millions of people that have lost their jobs or haven't been able to find a job and when you lose your job, your wage is zero. If you look in North Dakota, the energy industry, the average hourly wage in the oil and gas industry is $45.90 an hour. 
I want to see a lot more people making 40, 50, 60 dollars an hour and a lot fewer making zero dollars an hour unemployed. It's critical to remember also that the energy renaissance we're experiencing right now, it didn't come from Washington. It didn't come from a Department of Energy grant. It didn't come from a research project from the federal government. Despite the fact that I think three years ago the president told the country that he had invented fracking. It wasn't from the Department of Energy picking winners and losers. Or speaking more precisely in this administration, picking losers. It came from the private sector. It came from entrepreneurs right here. The men who put Spindletop on the map were Patillo Higgins, a self-taught geologist, and Anthony Francis Lucas, a former Austrian naval officer who came to America, earned his citizenship, and went into mining. The Lucas well was drilled after Standard Oil told him there was no oil here. The big guys said, don't worry, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your money, don't drill. And hard scrapple entrepreneurs, individual, the little guy, and you want to talk about who drives our economy, it's the little guy, it's the person who risks everything for the American dream. When they hit oil here, the gusher that resulted lasted nine days before anyone could cap it. You know, Joe Pratt, who's a history professor at the University of Houston, talks about the time spindle top. He says, we were playing with electric cars. We were playing with water and Stanley steamers and oil all at the same time. Then comes spindle top. And all of a sudden, people started to think, maybe it isn't going to be hard to decide what kind of car we're going to have. We have oil. And if you look at the American energy renaissance playing out right now, what transformed it? It was the use of long proven technology. Fracking has been used across Texas and across the country for over six decades. But yet, if you were to lay the responsibility for the energy renaissance we're seeing at the feet of one man, it would be George Mitchell, a modern day Hank Reardon. Here's how The Economist magazine described George Mitchell. Mitchell was the embodiment of the American dream. His father was a poor Greek immigrant, a goat herd, who later ran a shoeshine shop in Galveston, Texas. Mitchell had to work his way through university but graduated at the top of his class. Mitchell was also the embodiment of the entrepreneurial spirit. He did not discover shale, gas, and oil. Geological surveys had revealed them for decades before he started. He did not even invent fracking. It, had, it has been in use since the 1940s. But few great entrepreneurs invent something entirely new. His great list lay in a combination of vision and grit. He was convinced that technology could unlock the vast reserves of energy in the Barnett Shale beneath Dallas and Fort Worth, and he kept grappling with the unforgiving rock until it eventually surrendered its riches. Now, just like the men who drilled here at Spindletop, Mitchell was told over and over again what he was doing was crazy. You can't get the oil out of the, the, those shale formations. You can't get the gas out there. It doesn't make any sense. And yet he persevered. Not only that, there is no other state in the Union where Mitchell could have experimented and developed the right combination of horizontal, frac horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing to unlock shale than Texas. The regulatory environment that encourages businesses to come here to create jobs, to take risks, to put capital at risk so people can get jobs. Right. He experimented with the right way 
to drill shale in Dallas and Fort Worth, major metropolitan cities. Can you imagine another major city in the country? Can you imagine trying to do that in San Francisco? <laughs> and yet in Texas, now there were more than a few people who laughed at him, who said, this doesn't make any sense. I heard a story recently when he told his drilling engineer, I want you to frack that shale. And the engineer said, Mr. Mitchell, I'm not going to waste your money. We're not going to do that. And he said, you're either going to do that or I'm going to find someone who will. That perseverance has ushered in this new renaissance. And we cannot fall victim to what Friedrich Hayek called the fatal conceit that government invents, creates, and provides. Government doesn't invent and create or provide anything. It comes from the private sector, from those who risk their capital, their sweat, their labor. We're seeing a great American energy renaissance at a time when we desperately need growth and jobs. And yet there is one thing, and one thing only, that can screw it up. And that is the federal government. The bill that I am introducing, the American Energy Renaissance Act, will do, do two central things. Number one, it will stop the federal barriers to private entrepreneurs de developing our energy resources so that we can allow this energy renaissance to fully come to fruition and lift the prosperity, lift the good fortune, lift the lives of millions of people across this country. And we need to be clear, an energy agenda extends to a lot more than the Keystone Pipeline. Now, we need to build the Keystone Pipeline. There is a strong bipartisan supermajority in Congress to build the Keystone Pipeline, and the only reason that pipeline is not being built today is that President Obama is blocking it. His former energy secretary recently admitted, said the opposition to Keystone is not driven by science, it's political. That's President Obama's energy secretary. And you want to talk about an issue that should unite Republicans and Democrats. From a perspective of jobs in the economy, Keystone's a no-brainer. From a perspective of national security, becoming less dependent on foreign oil is a no-brainer. From a perspective of tax revenues, generating tens of thousands of high-paying jobs immediately, which President Obama, with the stroke of a pen, could remove the government barrier to those jobs being created, is a no-brainer. And even from the perspective of, it, of the environment, Keystone is a no-brainer. Let me tell you right now, if you are a Birkenstock-wearing, tree-hugging, Greenpeace activist, you should love the Keystone Pipeline. The reason is twofold. Number one, if we don't bring oil in on a pipeline, we'll continue to rely on overseas tankers with overseas oil. And as long as there are tankers on the oceans, we know to an absolute certainty there will be spills. From an environmental perspective, a pipeline is a far safer way to bring in the energy we need. But number two, it's not like the Canadians are just going to leave the tar sands alone. If they don't build Keystone north-south, they're going to build it east-west. They're going to send it to China where it will be refined in much, much dirtier refineries that will do more damage to the environment. So if all you care about is preventing damage to the environment, you should right now be calling for approving the Keystone Pipeline immediately. But we need to do a lot more. Critically, we need to prohibit the federal government from regulating restricting or banning hydraulic fracture. We need to trust the states to implement their laws to regulate fracking and keep the federal government out. The number one thing that could stop this energy renaissance is the federal government getting in the way of fracking. 
You know, it's very interesting. My office, we printed out a map of every county in the country. And we looked at whether median income had gone up or gone down. We color-coded it. The map looks like a geological survey of the country. It looks like the shale formations all across the country. The counties where median income have gone up, you can see them up in the Bakken, up in North Dakota. You can see them in the Barnett, you can see them in the Permian, you can see them down in the Eagleford, you can see them up in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. And then there's one cluster of bright green in and around Washington, D.C. Just about the entire rest of the country, median incomes have either been stagnant or gone down. And if you look at the Marcellus, Marcellus Shale doesn't end at the New York-Pennsylvania border. But the jobs do. You want to see the impact of foolhardy government policies. Even though the Marcellus Shale extends well into New York, the resources are there with a line as if written by the finger of man in the ground. That state barrier in New York fracking is illegal. Apparently, New Yorkers don't want the jobs, according to their politicians. Pennsylvania is seeing an abundance of economic prosperity as a result of the resources that New Yorkers enjoy none of it. We need to also streamline the permitting processes to new refineries and remove the barriers to developing our resources, including once and for all ending the Obama administration's war on coal. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to visit a coal mine in southern Illinois and to meet with family after family of coal miners who came one at a time and had the chance to shake hands with them, to visit to, with them and talk to them. I gotta tell you, looking in the eyes of these men and women was haunting. As they looked at you and realized the federal government is out to destroy their way of life, to drive them out of business, to take away their job. President Obama said, if you build a new coal plant, it'll bankrupt you. These are hardworking Americans whose way of life is under assault by the federal government. And let me tell you, the, 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 the American energy renaissance doesn't just create jobs in the energy sector. It also is creating the opportunity to bring back manufacturing jobs. Heavy manufacturing, the steel industry, the jobs that over the recent decades have fled this country. You know, manufacturing jobs represented present, and allowed the development of the backbone of the American middle class. Good, decent jobs where men and women could go and work and provide for their family, give their kids a better tomorrow. And those jobs, one after the other after the other, have gone overseas, have gone to other countries. Because of the American energy renaissance, we're bringing those jobs back to America, and we're competing with foreign nations like China, not based on low-cost energy. And Lord knows, we don't want to compete with China based on low-cost energy. But competing instead based on the abundant, low-cost natural resources with which God has blessed America. And the second critical element of the bill I'm introducing is to open up additional federal lands to new development and exploration. So we can take the energy renaissance that is occurring already and allow it to expand to create millions more jobs to lift the fortunes of people throughout this country. And I would note that a component of this bill is the additional revenues that will come from opening up new federal lands are to be dedicated to a trust fund, the Debt Freedom Fund, to pay down our national debt so we can turn around from bankrupting our kids and our grandkids. There have been a number of other senators who have led on energy issues, including Senator Lisa Murkowski, Senator David Vitter, Senator John Hoven, Senator James M. Inhofe. We are presenting ideas to create jobs and economic growth, not from government, but from the private sector by stopping government from getting in the way. Let me 
me say a final point. If you look over the last five years of the Obama administration, some people have done well. The rich have done just fine under President Obama. Right now, today, the top 1% earn a higher share of our national income than any time since 1928. But after all, nothing bad happened after 1928. <laughs> Wall Street is doing just fine under President Obama. The policies of this administration, big government, big business, easily gets in bed with big government. They have armies of lawyers and accountants and lobbyists. The people who have been hurt, the people who have been forgotten in America are hardworking Americans. The people who have been left behind with this stagnant growth are the men and women throughout Texas, throughout this country that want to go and work and provide for their families. And they're finding jobs taken away not available because of federal government policies that are hammering small businesses. We need to be a champion for the middle class. We need to be a champion for working men and women. We need to be a champion for economic growth. And let me tell you, the greatest boon to the American middle class, the greatest boon to working men and women is the American energy renaissance that is underway right now and we need to come together in a bipartisan way and prevent the federal government from making it harder for people all across this country to achieve the American dream. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer a few questions. We want to help, but you are one of the people that listen to us. I have called my congressman. No one's interested but you and a few in Washington. And I feel like I'm wasting my call. Well, th thank you for that question. And, and let me tell you, I, I understand your frustration. Um, I understand your frustration. I, what you hear all across Texas, what you hear all across the country, is that Washington isn't listening. And, and this, by the way, is not a partisan issue. You hear this from Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians. They say, look, entrenched politicians in Washington, in both parties, they're not listening to the American people. But, but let me give you a word of encouragement, which is... The past year I've been blessed to travel across the state of Texas, to travel across the country. Everywhere I go, I see thousands upon thousands of men and women who are standing up and saying we want to bring back economic growth, we want to bring back jobs, we want to get back to our constitutional liberties. We are seeing a grassroots movement that is making D.C. listen, that is holding elected officials accountable. So. What you're doing speaking out makes a huge difference and let me encourage you, keep doing it and keep spreading the word. Well, there are many aspects of what the EPA is doing that have been harmful. Some of them in the coal industry, the EPA has been putting crushing burdens that is, are causing hundreds of coal units to be shut down that, that are wreaking devastation throughout coal country. But the biggest single threat from the EPA is not what they have done yet, but it is what they are threatening to do, which is to put federal regulation over fracking. If you were to pick one step that would be catastrophic to the American energy renaissance, it would be having the federal government step in the way of fracking, which has been ongoing for over 60 years. We should trust state regulators to protect our natural resources, but not to stand in the way of, of the incredible job, jobs and economic production that can and should come from the energy renaissance. Oh, look, there are 
both both Katrina and Ken are, are people I've known a long time. I've worked with them. I respect and admire them, and, and I've said so publicly. Um, the fact that some candidates have have chosen to reference that, you know, what I think that really is an acknowledgement of is what we were just talking about a minute ago. It's an acknowledgement of the energy and passion from the grassroots. And, and, and I think that's seen as a sign from, from a candidate that they are committing, they're gonna listen to the grassroots as well. And, and I think that's a real testament to the only thing that's gonna turn this country around. It's not gonna come from Washington, it's gonna come from the American people. And I think every candidate should be held accountable by the grassroots. I think that dynamic is a very positive one and, and, and it is certainly a reality in Texas uh, and beyond. Senator, I'm Judy Nichols. I'm running for state rep. And I keep hearing repeatedly how devastating bigger waters is going to be to my district with Orange, yep. Jefferson County, and the flood levels. It's bankrupting our cities just to appeal to arbitrary flood claims. Our communities were built on the promise of NFI. Judy, thank you for that question. I, I, I agree with you on that. The, 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 the bigger waters has, has resulted in shifting from a situation where you had an underfunded program that was that had, was $29 billion in the hole to such a drastic reform that you saw people throughout the Gulf Coast, throughout coastal communities, suddenly seeing dramatic increases in premiums that didn't reflect actual risk. And, and, and I agree we need mitigation. You can't have the government just pull the rug out of people suddenly in a way that's not predictable. I think it's unfortunate when the Senate considered the bill to address it that, that Senate Democrats refused to find a way to reform the program, to find a fiscally responsible way to reform the program. So in the Senate, I supported an amendment that was introduced, the Toomey Amendment, to reform the program in a, in a way to mitigate the harm to people from the, from the sudden shift, but at the same time put the program on sound financial footing. And I'm hopeful that it, as it goes to the House, that the House will address the hardship that's been faced, but do so in a way that is also responsible for our national debt and, and is fiscally responsible to all taxpayers. There's been a lot of discourse between those members of the party. I should expect to be support to make it go past. Well, I think at the end of the day, every elected official, both Republican and Democrat, should listen to the American people. My approach in, in the brief 13 months I've served in the Senate has been consistently to make the case to the American people, not to Washington, because listen, Washington is broken. The greatest divide we have is not between Democrats and Republicans. The greatest divide we have in politics, I believe, is between entrenched politicians in Washington in both parties and the American people. And the way we unify Republicans is to energize and mobilize the grassroots, to energize and mobilize the American people to hold elected officials accountable and to get Republicans back to the principles we should have been standing for initially, free market principles and the Constitution. How do we bring support behind the American Energy Renaissance Act? We make the case to the American people that their top priority is economic growth and jobs and the American energy renaissance provides the best solution to the Obama economy, allowing the private sector to create that economic growth and jobs. Last question. Senator, the state of Texas recently, through a massive effort of manpower and technology, effectively closed the border between Texas and, and Mexico. Uh, for a period of about three weeks to measure the cost of that. When will we see effective legislation, effective and measurable legislation out of Washington to do the same thing? Well, Bob, th thank you for that question. Um, with respect to immigration, I actually think if you get outside of Washington, that there is widespread bipartisan agreement on immigration. Outside of Washington, D.C., there is widespread bipartisan agreement, number one, that we got to get serious and secure the borders. Do exactly what you're talking about. Put resources and manpower and solve the problem of illegal immigration. 
I think there is also outside of Washington widespread bipartisan agreement that we need to improve and streamline legal immigration. We need to remain a nation that doesn't just welcome, that celebrates legal immigrants. As you know, my dad came as a legal immigrant in 1957 with nothing but a hundred bucks sewn into his underwear and a desire in his heart to work towards the American dream. All of us are the children of those who risked everything for freedom. If Congress focused on the areas of bipartisan agreement, if Congress focused on securing the borders and improving and streamlining legal immigration, we could craft an immigration bill that could sail through both houses of Congress. Unfortunately, right now, President Obama and the Senate Democrats are far more focused on partisan advantage and scoring political points than actually solving the problem. I, I think that's a mistake. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, and God bless you.